been a cell repeater in the building yet, so there was no cell signal unless you're leaning up against the specific walls. And uh, you'd, you'd go whole days without seeing the sun. You'd come in at dark, you'd leave at dark. <laughs> it's just... Yeah, I, I've, yeah. Been there, done that. Not fun. They made it better. Mm. Yeah, well, it also, it hate, it, it, it's problematic when it's winter, and, you know, it's, that's like a common occurrence. So up here, there's um, uh, one of the big banks up here, BMO, has uh, the Capital Markets Group is on what's called the dungeon. It's the old vault inside of the, uh, the bank building. So they're like two levels down in a basement. They get rats. They get, <laughs> they get everything. It's horrible. It's like literally the IT crowd. Yeah, you know, it's it's uh, sorry, I mean Capital Markets IT. So it's all Capital Markets <laughs> IT folks, wealth management. You've seen well. the show, yeah? Beautiful. Yes, <laughs> it is. It is like that. It's horrible. I had a project at Sikorsky, and I was underneath the factory in Connecticut, and it's like, you know, six feet of concrete, and it, you're in the computer room, and it's, so it's like, you know, 50 degrees in there, freezing, and, uh, you know, you'd hear, uh, you know, machinery passing above you and stuff like that, and I had, uh, my job was to figure out why these intermec readers, you know, the rate workstation readers weren't working. And uh, the network was going to, I built a little program to ping everything. And every day at four o'clock, network would go down and, you know, walked around the factory floor one time and hung out by uh, one of the readers. And at four o'clock, this big old fat guy with a beard shows up, turns on a welder. <laughs> it was right over the network cable. And uh, it was, uh, I was like, oh, do you do that every day at four o'clock? And he goes, yep. <laughs> so I got a similar story from uh, Capital Markets in the UK where we had this mysterious outage on the swaps desk every day at like eight o'clock at night. And eventually worked out it was the cleaning lady coming in and plugging in her vacuum and she had unplug the power supply to the swaps desk. I was about to say, we had something very similar happen in one of the distribution centers. Uh, they were, you know, uh, it wasn't every night, but, you know, we'd have servers crash and it was uh, the, the floor polisher. I have a buddy who uh, was doing a tour of the data center. Back in the day, they let people in there. And uh, we were very proud of this architecture we'd come up with to do fault tolerance on uh, 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 BMS stuff. And so, you know, the, the trick was to go over to one of your servers that was running and turn off the server because it has a switch on the front. And, um, and you know, you'd look at the little screen and everything would keep on running. And so uh, the partner is touring with the, uh, the client and, you know, has seen my buddy do this demonstration a couple of times. And so he goes over and, uh, and he goes, and it's great because you can turn off a server and everything keeps on running. And he goes over and clicks off a server. And he goes, Bob, how's stuff doing? He goes, Bob says, it's going great because you didn't turn off our server. <laughs> <laughs> Vax VMS was cool. I like that a lot, especially when clustering came out. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I was a big uh, Vax VMS guy. Star clusters, CI connects, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, Street we inherited one. Manager, the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, we had one when uh, the bank bought uh, another small bank in the UK, and we again inherited the uh, the VMS with it. Yeah, <laughs> Steve. Ah, let's see. Deck. Uh, oh yeah, Vax VMS. Very cool. I still somewhere. I I have a old internals handbook someplace. I, I couldn't get rid of it. I spent so much time with it, I think. Yeah, the internals manual, like, was uh, the uh, manual two or whatever. The second one in the series was the one that sat on my desk. Yeah, I'm not nearly that cool. Uh, no, you're way cooler. You're way cooler, <laughs> Brian. Come on. <laughs> Uh, I've atrophied, and you, your, you know, your eminence has just grown, and uh, right. 
I think the closest I came was in college, and one of my student jobs was swapping tapes on the on the vax machines at the at the uh, engineering school. Mm. And creating user accounts. My first exposure to the internet. <laughs> I think Vax VMS was the last time I could actually elegantly log on to a remote server. You know, like it, I mean, like in your house, like you know, with PCs and stuff. They're they're all they're all around, but I can I'll be damned if I can figure out what the you know magic uh, spell I have to uh, say to to get in half the time. Just you know, give me a username and a password, and let me in. Well, shall we get started on our, on our meetup? I, I don't know how many more people will get. It's six yeah, minutes yeah. past. I think go ahead and get started. Do you want to kick it off, Peter? Uh, sure. So, so welcome everybody to the BVSSH uh, meetup for tonight. And we've got a couple of wonderful guests that, uh, as I was commenting uh, earlier, I'm really looking forward to hearing speak. Uh, so, I, I guess I can pass it over to you. Uh, so, Greg or Matt, do you have uh, slides you're looking to present or anything like that? Yes. Hi, it's Greg. I will be sharing my screen. Okay. I'll just quickly make you able to do that. So you should now have the capability. There we go. Okay. And, uh, and over to you. Well, thank you. Uh, it's great to have this opportunity to speak with this group. Headphones. Enjoyed uh, viewing the past presentations that found on, archived on YouTube. And the topic for tonight is uh, near and dear to myself and my uh, co-founder, Matt. Uh, we're the principals of a new project that's looking into cloud configuration management, infrastructure provisioning, and secrets control. So some of our remarks are framed from our last two years, really diving into this topic and figuring out some new ideas that we want to bring to market. Um, this also is a good topic that complements the last session that was focused on CICD. Um, so we hope to be as informative as, as Charity was, maybe without so many F-bombs dropped, and we'll uh, have a good spirited discussion, I hope, back and forth. Um, anyway, uh, so for tonight, we want to talk about cloud configuration and secrets management, especially as it relates to having a better uptime and better security posture, and indirectly, uh, better cost control. We, we find that cloud configuration is at the heart of doing everything well in the cloud these days. Um, we also understand there's a lot of on-prem out there as well. Uh, we're not going to be talking about that so much for this session, but many of the points that we're going to be making, I think, would be relevant to thinking about managing holistically uh, configuration and secrets and provisioning both on-prem and in the cloud. Uh, but for, the, for this time, we want to just really focus on the cloud aspect of everything that we're going to be dealing with. Um, I also tend to use the words config management and secrets management interchangeably. Uh, our thesis is that uh, you know, they're all settings at some level and managing them differently um, has sort of been the history. You have your non-secrets and your secrets and use different systems. Going forward, we see sort of a, a bringing those together into one more uh, comprehensive type of capability, uh, applying the same types of controls, whether it's a password or a uh, memory cache setting for a backend service. One you might typically store um, in a secret system like Vault, and the other you might store in a parameter database. But uh, overall, we think everything should be protected at the same level um, for good hygiene and best practices. The backdrop to what we're bringing forward tonight is based on uh, our research looking at these challenges from a number of different perspectives. So I wanted to set some context on the configuration management topic for tonight. Uh, we've surveyed over 500 cloud DevOps leaders over the past 18 months. We wanted to understand how cloud configuration challenges were being solved, what pain, point, what pain, pain points exist um, that never seem to get addressed. And it was a tremendous experience to go through this effort, um, even wrote a blog post series around um, the process of interviewing 500 people, understanding what we learned from those interactions and the different techniques we had developed to understand some kind of core truths. So that's the backdrop of 
uh, some of the commentary we'll be bringing forward is uh, the learnings from our research, um, speaking to uh, many of the peers um, in the group around here tonight. A high level summary, uh, after hundreds of conversations, we noticed specific sentiment I wanted to summarize here. Uh, at a top level, as the cloud gets more mature and more capable, i.e. we're getting more different discrete services from the major vendors like Amazon, Google, uh, and Azure, configuration um, is not getting easier, but rather more difficult. And it shows up in a number of different areas. Um, the first is now there's multiple layers of configuration that need to be managed. And we're talking about layers. If you think about an infrastructure point of view, you have your infrastructure layer or your IaaS layer, um, your PaaS layer, your SaaS layer. In the early cloud years, we only had to deal with basically two layers. It was the infrastructure and your apps. And then came platform as a service, which added a whole other level of complexity and dimension to configuration and secrets management. And then after PaaS came uh, layering in SaaS and API services, such as Twilio and SendGrid and Okta and Stripe. Every project that we encountered typically used about five of these services that were in addition to the applications that were being organically created inside of a company's own DevOps, shop, a DevOps team. So this all adds up to uh, a different layer of complexity and a lot of dimensions that need to be managed today that didn't exist just a few years ago. Uh, we also found that companies love the specific tools that they're using right now, like Terraform for provisioning your cloud and Ansible for configuring your apps and Vault for managing your secrets and, and Git and Jenkins and, and the other tools that sort of surround the core configuration and secrets management. Uh, tools. But the problem is, is that we're lacking that ability to have a single source, a record of truth. So what we have are single sources of truth that makes it hard to get a single record of truth. And that's the only way to really understand how a cloud system is configured, because otherwise you're going to get blindsided by problems hidden in plain sight. We also heard a lot about tool sprawl, especially in organizations where DevOps is decentralized versus centralized management. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. That's a specific, specific learnings that we wanted to bring forward. Uh, there's also this uh, aspect of too much reliance on tribal knowledge as the main way to understand why systems are configured the way they are. Uh, that presents challenges to onboarding new people, or you could be at risk if some of your tribal elders decide to leave and the team is at a loss to understand how certain systems are configured because it wasn't well documented or memorialized anywhere and that becomes friction towards faster progress. So all this colludes against good security practices, good governance and compliance, good cost controls, and good uptime. I'm curious whether with head nods that this type of, type of feedback resonates. Are you hearing this from your groups and so forth? These are challenges that probably aren't too startling um, to realize, but it's interesting to see it call forward in such stark contrast and um, what our respondents shared with us. So it's uh, something that we wanted to mention as we go through this talk. When we think about what DevOps teams describe to us as what they're looking for, this mental model emerges. And it's around this idea of managing configuration holistically. So focusing on ability to get a single record of truth that focuses on the configuration data, data layer that exists in every project using the cloud. So walking through this a bit, uh, we have our Customer cloud systems, you know, Amazon, Azure, GCP, Kubernetes is always involved in this um, discussion, it seems like. Uh, there's such a massive amount of interest in Kubernetes and moving from on-prem to cloud and big, big massive migrations are always, always bringing in a Kubernetes focus. And then we have all the different third-party user interfaces that DevOps teams and DevOps engineers need to be accessing. Those contain different sources of truth that aren't necessarily available and available to other parts of the system. There's always usually some type of a vault in the, involved, whether it's actually HashiCorp vault or the equivalents. And there's an existing healthy tool chain of, of components that are trusted, Terraform, Puppet, GitHub, and so forth. And these all interact with all the major components that you see in your DevOps stack. So what customers tell us in terms of what their desire is to have a cross-cutting, downward-looking view into how everything is configured, including managing of secrets, managing of config settings across apps and services, and managing of the provisioning settings of the cloud environment. 
what this sounds like to me is a CMDB, but no one really wants to talk about a CMDB these days because probably PTSD from past CMDB projects that never really went well or required too much care and feeding. And that was a, a learning from us is that the modern day cloud DevOps folks are describing the positive attributes and desire for a CMDB, um, but they're not using that terminology. So it's an interesting point in time where we are is the evolution of the cloud tools movement that um, what's that being asked for uh, is something that we've had access to for many, many years, but hasn't been recast in a more modern way. So we'll touch upon that in a, in a little bit as well. Before going forward, I just wanted to take a big a look back into the past around how configuration management has evolved, because I think understanding the history of configuration management and secrets management helps tie the narrative together from what we've seen in the past to where we're going in the future. But first, it's good to get a description around what configuration management means. And we're speaking specifically around cloud configuration management, thinking that there's three major pillars to this platform. There's infrastructure provisioning and the tools that are available from the cloud native offerings from Amazon, Azure, Google. And then there's third party tools that are excelling at provisioning cloud environments. Terraform and Pulumi come to mind. And provisioning cloud environments means creating the, the infrastructure that will then host your apps and services. So that's not focused so much on app configuration. That's another set of tools uh, modeled by Ansible and Puppet and Chef and Staltzak. Uh, from our survey, Ansible and Puppet are the ones that seem to be most common these days. Chef and Puppet are, are waning a bit. Um, and then SaltStack is always behind the scenes. And in terms of secrets management, the third pillar to really good cloud configuration hygiene, uh, we have our standard offerings like Vault and CyberArk, what we're doing with our project, and then the cloud native offerings like Amazon and Google and GCP all have a built-in very specific secrets management capability that often is used alongside of an implementation of Vault. So that just adds more complexity to what we're seeing out there in terms of getting a holistic view about how everything's configured. And the reason why that's important is because the um, risks that come along without having a very thoughtful approach to this, where you can get yourself into trouble with security vulnerabilities because you don't have a great way to manage your secrets, or there's leaks in the secrets, or configuration management in general. Um, if it's not done correctly, you can um, have unplanned downtime and other problems that emerge. So that's a kind of a quick overview of how we think about cloud configuration management supported by those three pillars of functionality. But configuration management is one piece of the greater cloud tooling puzzle. And what we see um, as an emerging landscape of offerings, uh, application performance management to test automation, feature flagging, fault injection, CICD, at the heart of all this is configuration management. Oftentimes configuration management and secrets management is the weave that goes through all these different components. Configuration management is often used now to configure other components like your APM system or your CICD system or your logging system. It all kind of ties back to each other in a, um, a positive virtuous cycle. Our thinking is that good configuration practices, good, good around infrastructure provisioning, app and con services config and secrets management is the key to better security posture, better uptime, and better cost control. But right now, the cloud is the most significant wave of change in our time. And we need to be dealing with that in a more holistic, positive way than what we have been in the past. And that's around this concept of understanding the history of configuration management changes over the cloud years. So beyond the cloud, there was a very healthy, healthy configuration management market the ITSM market, the ITOM market, um, up to the first generation of cloud starting around 2005, we basically had very nascent tools that were available to us as cloud pioneers and cloud DevOps folks taking those first steps into the cloud. So the control panels from Amazon and Microsoft and the other cloud providers uh, were the way that we managed the uh, ability to set up our um, stack in the cloud, so to speak. It wasn't uh, you know, too out of the ordinary for us to be clicketing through multiple user interfaces. And that was considered the modern state of configuring my and provisioning my AWS environment. 
what drove a lot of this towards the second generation is uh, all the scripting that the DevOps teams had to manage over time. And that was really um, a, a key impetus to the arrival of the second generation of tools where we saw the beginning of infrastructure as code and Chef and Puppet emerging as ways to configure your applications in a better way where you can describe what you wanted as a, a set of source code files. And then we see the rise of services like HashiCorp and so forth um, as they start to emerge on the market to address these pain points. So each, each next generation address the pain points of the past generation to the point where we are right now in the third generation of configuration management, uh, which is also the beginning of what we call kind of cloud 2.0, where the architecture patterns of what are possible today um, are different than just what they were five years ago with the focus on functions as a service, uh, the breaking up of monoliths into microservices, the rise of serverless, the rise of APIs um, that are linking and, and knitting applications together in different ways that were in the past. Uh, it's a, uh, a theme that is needing to be addressed by the new entrants on the market. And then there's the overlay of Kubernetes on top of everything. Uh, that seems to be a big theme that we learned about in our research is uh, while we're focused on how do we configure and provision and control our secrets, we have to now layer in what's the effect of Kubernetes on everything. And it does change things dramatically in terms of how we think about holistic uh, secrets management and configuration control um, with the impact and the fast rise of, of Kubernetes. So uh, I just want to give you a quick uh, history in terms of how we see the evolution of the configuration management and secrets market evolving from the first gen tools roughly uh, 15 years ago to the second gen tools in the last decade, and now 2020 going forward, uh, the third generation of tools. Does that make sense? Um, any, you know, any questions, please don't hesitate to uh, chime in. We'd like to make this as interactive as possible. Um, hey, this, this is James Simon. I, I, have, a, I have a question, um, and it kind of goes back a few slides, uh, but it, it circles back onto this one. So it, is it really important that the tools uh, and like your pipeline and everything gets centralized, or is it that the patterns and principles should be standardized? It, it, are both necessary? I, we're having this debate right now at work, right? About how much do we let people use their own tools uh, and just make sure that they follow a certain set of practices, right? In, in their pipeline or versus how much do we centralize? Um, yeah, Matt, do you want to um, address that? It's something you've been thinking a lot about. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, it depends on the tools, right, and what what domain they're 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 operating in, right? Um, you know, something like configuration, which cuts across your entire system, probably makes sense to to, to centralize that, right? Use the same same tool there across your whole system because you know everybody uh, you know needs to deal with it, right? So you might as well all do it the same way. However, tools that are you know, you know, maybe development tools or, uh, you know, even deployment tools or cloud tools, you know, it, that that's all pick the right tool for the job uh, for the component that you're working on. Um, but yeah, the cross cutting things, the things that affect every single component in your stack, uh, it's, it's definitely a lot easier if those are centralized, um, especially when you consider that you know, the cross-cutting concerns of an organization are usually managed by one team, right? So, you know, your ops or DevOps team is, is managing these cross-cutting concerns, right? They need to be able to monitor all the pieces. They need to be able to configure all the pieces. They need to be able to, you know, see the logging, I guess that's under monitoring or, or whatnot. But you have this one team that's cross-cutting across your organization. And if they have to deal with multiple tools, they'll be pulling their hair out all the time, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Right, so, but developers tend to want to focus on, all right, what's the exact right tool I need to get my job done right away right now, right? Um, and they're, they're focused on that narrow slice. And if the tool they pick doesn't impact anybody else, that's fine. I mean, uh, it, you know, at some point you may have too many tools and then it makes it hard for people to jump between projects, um, you know, but- it, Yeah, we're, it, we're, we're trying to strike this balance between security, right? architecture and developer enablement. Right. right, and 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 make it easy for the developers, but also make sure that you know we're hitting the mark with governance and exactly. and uh, with security. Right. So, okay. Thank you.
Pleasure. Yeah. yeah, this is a that's a great question. Where are where are you leaning towards? Um, are any um, any sort of leading thought that's emerging as your team thinks about this? Yeah, so it depends on who you ask. I, I, I mean, coming from my perspective, uh, we're just undergoing a massive transformation, right? And moving into product teams. I'd rather just let the work show us and uh, write the rules and pick the tools as we go. Uh, other people want to centralize everything and they want to come up with the tool stack like right now, right? So I, I think probably the answer is in the middle, <laughs> but uh, I, I guess we'll see. If I can ask, are the people who want it centralized the same people who are doing the work? No, uh, interestingly enough, they are not. They are the people who are managing the work. Okay. Or monitoring the uh, the runtime, right? Right. Yeah. A very few ops people actually are involved. It's, it's more like executive level management, and some of us who are closer to boots on the ground. Uh, I've been complaining that I want developers there, so. So hopefully we'll get some developers involved soon and that'll help uh, bridge the gap. Great, great question, thanks. So wanted to uh, dive into our learnings and tie that back to the challenges that are facing teams managing um, configuration and security for better uptime and uh, better security posture. So we've distilled down seven uh, learnings from our research and we'll go through those now. The first is that the ongoing evolution of monoliths to microservices is having a huge impact on configuration best practices. And overlaid on top of this is the fact that Kubernetes is looming large behind almost every modern cloud migration project uh, or a container strategy in general, which often leads to Kubernetes. And then you get into the issues of, are you gonna manage Kubernetes yourself? Are you gonna rely upon a managed offering from one of the cloud providers like, um, you know, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Oracle, they all have their own managed Kubernetes uh, capability. But this movement from monolith to microservices brings in other challenges that I'd like Matt to expand upon. It's an area that he's been studying a lot as he thinks about product strategy. Yeah, I think, you know, in general, um, when you're building something new, it's easier to build it as a monolith, right? It's easier to have everything in one place, quicker to iterate on it. Um, you know, easier to think about it and make changes and whatnot. Uh, but as projects mature, you know, they move away from being monoliths to being, uh, you know, more more decentralized and more decoupled, uh, you know, to make it easier for the things you're building to scale with your team, right? So that you can get pieces of your team focused on one part without having to worry about the rest of it. Um, and then, you know, so that's sort of your traditional uh, migration from monoliths to not necessarily microservices, but a decoupled decentralized system. Um, and and in, in the, the modern cloud era, that's even more the case because it's a lot easier to break up your system. You know, if you're going serverless, it's, it's a lot of little tiny components that uh, are kind of interacting and being weaved together. Uh, you'll still have microservices or regular services. You'll have all these managed services like, you know, an RDS database from Amazon or, you know, SQS and SNS from Amazon, things like that. So, you know, you got all these, uh, you know, all these little pieces making up your system, <laughs> right? It's no longer just a, you know, you know, big fat monolith that makes it easier for you to think about, but rather this completely spread out uh, uh, system that while is good for, you know, having a large team being able to work on isolated portions of it, it makes it very hard for say your ops team to manage it as a system. So, you know, that's where we see a lot of sort of breakdown. Um, it's easy to manage a monolith. It's not so easy to manage something that's, that's more spread out like that. And then Kubernetes as well, uh, you know, it enables easier microservices um, or even functions as a service if you want to take it that far uh, to be more of a, a serverless model. Uh, but the, the whole functions as a service is still very uh, immature. So. I don't think very many people are using that yet. There's a strong desire for that, but I think the Nirvana promise land is still further down in the, the timeline for a pure functions as a service um, uh, app stack for sure. Uh, second learning is an astounding three quarters of survey respondents told us that misconfigurations were the leading contributing factor to either unplanned downtime or a security breach. Um, that was quite a startling um, learning for me from the surveys. 
in terms of 75% felt that uh, they had been su substantially impacted by a misconfiguration, either bringing the system down in an unplanned way or causing some type of security incident that required uh, remediation. Um, even across the major cloud vendors uh, over the past few years, uh, Google, Azure, Amazon have all suffered very public outages. And when you study their root cause analysis, as that typically get published to their engineering blogs uh, a few days later, almost every one of them was tied back to a security, um, sorry, a misconfiguration of some type, either at the infrastructure level or at their, at their control plane level, which is invisible to us as their cloud customers. So this is an area that I think the industry can do better at in terms of providing uh, guardrails around configuration management, specialized tooling that help enforce uh, proper policies, procedures. Um, it's a classic problem of people, process, and technology need to come together in a coordinated effort to reduce the number of misconfigurations that can uh, get into a production environment. And that's an area that we're studying for some eventual product innovations that we'd like to bring to market around helping customers um, have a better experience around this. Any, any questions on this? Any uh, sh stories someone would like to share uh, that would be interesting to hear? So I'll avoid responding to the word root cause, but what were the causes of the misconfigurations? I mean, misconfigurations is a big ball of wax. Like, Yeah, so typically it would be a, uh, a setting um, was manually edited by a person uh, in production, but then did not get reflected back into source control. So that was sort of a, a process failure in terms of, of uh, on the on the fly hotspot. These are the these are the war stories. Exactly. That we heard. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, but that's a process failure. That's not a misconfiguration failure, in well, my head. Yeah. But I'm, maybe I'm missing something. Yeah, but it ties into uh, it ties into configuration brought this, you know, misconfiguration brought the system down. Uh, typically it reflects on inadequate testing of the scripts and so forth at configure environments or uh, the ability to let people change core settings that they shouldn't have access to. Uh, maybe cache sizes, timeout values, uh, allocated RAM towards a module, that type of stuff, which ties directly into configuration of apps and services or the underlying provisioned infrastructure. OK, thank you. Sure, I've got another example uh, for you of uh, so somebody taking the default security or the default configuration off the Amazon website. So basically configuring it based off what Amazon has said in their documentation, but that configuration they give you is insecure. So that then opens up your service <laughs> because there's not enough understanding um, to be able to know how to properly configure it and ensure that it is actually protected. That's a good one. Yeah. I think there's a whole yeah, theme around. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just saying that documentation is horrendous as examples because they go wide open. For sure. Uh, there's there's a lot of opportunity there to get um, more improvement um, in this area for sure. Um, the next learning is uh, tied into the you know shift left movement, and why shift left is so important is you know quicker time to value empowers developers with more self service capabilities, um, where op still has to be the guardrails to make sure we don't um, inflict ourselves with harm. Um, includes everything from bringing the, you know, the security analysis into the IDE, for example. So bringing that closer to where you're writing your code or you're pulling in your open source modules, um, making sure there's no vulnerabilities that are gonna be um, seeping in from the, uh, from the sideways. The, uh, where configuration management plays into this, I think is an area of opportunity for vendors that are playing in this space to participate in the shift left movement, bring config awareness closer to where developers are writing their code, uh, checking things into source repositories and providing uh, earlier alerts when there could be detrimental config values that um, could seep into a production system. Uh, Matt, did you have some um, thoughts on this that uh, would be interesting to hear? Yeah, I mean, you know, shift left, it, it's it's very developer centric. I'm a developer, right? But I'm also an ops guy, so I kind of I can, I can talk bad about both of them. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, shift left is definitely more developer centric in that it's 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 
you know, it's geared towards developers having an easier time um, setting up and, and building and running a system. Uh, but, you know, invariably you reach a, a, a size of a company where the developers are no longer the ones that are, are actually managing the system in production, right? They're not the ones answering the pager uh, or, you know, having to deal with a, 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 a site issue or something. It's typically an operations team or, you know, maybe even a DevOps team. Um, so, you know, there needs to be some level of communication, even if you do shift left, right, you know, there needs to be some, some level of communication so that the ops team um, is able to manage systems that they don't necessarily have a full understanding of. Um, and this is where interfaces become very important. Um, and, you know, we think that, you know, being able to declare what your configuration interface is for each of the components in your system would help with that. Um, but, you know, it's still a thesis. We're still trying to figure out the right way to enable that. Uh, but yeah, you know, you got the ops team cutting across all of the components and the, and the developers, again, you know, dealing with their, their swim lanes and that, that communication uh, needs to be enhanced in order to prevent uh, failures from propagating through the system. Yeah, thanks. Uh, anyone have um, comments around uh, their particular perspective on shift left or how they see it positively or not positively impacting the outcomes and results? Okay. Another, another term for shift left is uh, GitOps. A lot of people will use the word GitOps to, to indicate that they're shifting left. Uh, they're managing their system by, you know, doing Git operations or operations in a Git system that thereby propagate to affecting your, your infrastructure. I, I'd like to, if I can jump in for a sec, because yeah, that, that, that's kind of where my head has been at is, is a lot of the stuff we were talking about even earlier when we were talking about configuration management is like, like a lot of that could be modeled with like infrastructure as code and all your configuration as code and then everything being triggered by automated pipelines moving through an environment, which is a setup we've done on some systems. And it, it sounds like it's all feeding back to, you know, have a centralized secrets management and then reference those secrets and source control and then just drive everything out of source control. And then you have your authoritative source of truth for the state of the system, it's whatever's in Git and everything is derived from that. Yeah, that makes I mean, a lot of sense. It's certainly a, 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 you know, a reasonable way to do it. Um, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> or fortunately, uh, not, not everybody or every team is uh, capable of setting all that up, right? Uh, so, you know, that's, that's where vendors like ourselves come in and try and, and make portions of that easier uh, if they want to go down that path, but also give them ways to achieve similar uh, capabilities with their existing systems. Great. Thanks for the questions and um, extended commentary. So it's not just great. But yeah, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in infrastructure as code um, and, you know, automating as much as possible. Uh, but invariably you hit this you hit the Pareto rule, right? You can you can do ninety percent of it, but ten percent just you know there's just <laughs> no end of headache in uh, trying to get that last ten percent to work if you can even do it, right? Uh, so you know there needs to be some kind of an escape hatch for that manual level of things uh, sometimes. Awesome. Uh, another area that we studied is the uh, movement towards DevOps being managed as its own group alongside of mainline software development or DevOps being embedded inside of software teams or a hybrid approach. And more than half of the respondents indicated they were using the embedded or hybrid approach, which means they had a, a matrix structure. Um, what was lacking in those environments was a single kind of decision-making thread that could help smooth out uh, decentralized aspects of choosing different tools for, for the same problem across uh, different teams and larger organizations. So the embedded or hybrid model team structures had higher incidence of self-inflicted wounds and tool sprawl because each team was making their own decisions and choices without some type of centralized um, uh, decision authority. And Matt, would you like to weigh in on this uh, aspect as well? Yeah, I think the picture says it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uncoordinated, right? So that just leads up into problems where configuration management issues can um, wreak havoc on production environments. And it's an area that we were surprised that more than half said that they were doing the embedded model 
or the hybrid model. Um, and that seems to be actually a, a trend going towards the future uh, from what we can tell. And so different tools and techniques will be needed to manage that new world that we're moving ourselves into around the way that DevOps and SRE teams are associated with uh, mainline software development. I think a lot of the problem too is people make um, sort of sweeping declarations about this is the right way to do something. And while that may be true for certain sizes of organizations, it's not true for other sizes of organizations. Um, and you kind of have to pick the right process and the right tools depending on, you know, how large you are, how large your team sizes are, you know, how, you know, how you're set up to do work within the organization. It's, it's there is no one size fit all kind of a thing. Um, and, and we can't copy paste and cookie cutter and nope. <laughs> yeah. Um, Start on with on this one, I kind of side with um, the uh, Matthew Skelton book and trying to do the whole platform um, team or doing that central platform side, but letting the individual product teams do the work themselves. And uh, yeah, you're, you're providing the capability and the tools as a platform and then having maybe an enablement team that goes out and educates and evangelizes the organization, but the end teams then doing the work themselves. This gets to the heart of what I was asking about this James Simon again, and, and sort of, I, I'm a fan of uh, what, what I think is the way Brian did things where you, you dictate uh, what the system or what an application or what tool you're using needs to be able to achieve and you, you know, the practices and the guidelines and the principles. And, and then hold teams to the results, but then let them do it their way. Is what I've been trying to advocate and not everybody agrees with me. Um, and, so it would be like an embedded well, DevOps, but you're, you put some, some guardrails on it, right? From a central place. Yeah, and uh, the thing is I've, I've long held the same belief as you till I started managing the DevOps platform at my organization. and. The thing is for the ones who are leading the charge, they want to do things uh, and they want to kind of do things differently. But what I'm finding in the organization is 90% don't know they're being told by management to do this DevOps thing and they just want to be told what to do. Gotcha. So uh, for for that reason, uh, the, the centralization and kind of setting up the platform and the standard tool set is useful. And then I think for that 10% that want to do things differently or want to uh, really innovate and do, do the higher level, that's where you need to define those guardrails and say, this is the minimum kind of security set. And if you want to do things uh, outside of the central platform, then you need to adhere to all of these security aspects, all the operational aspects, and you would have to almost fund it yourself as well. So you're taking like a, a both approach. You're providing a, a sort of top-down platform, but then also mm -hmm. allowing for going outside of that as long as you meet the minimum requirements. That's interesting. Yeah, which security kind of goes down hard and then people find that it's very difficult to do uh, all of that. So. Yeah, they so, choose to. So, so, so one key false. thing I heard. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I was going to say it's, it's kind of a false choice. We, I mean, we we took the same track at Walmart, which is uh, here's the central platform, and it's extensible. I mean, you can. It's really easy to do something simple. If you want to do something complex, feel free. And if you want to go completely outside the platform, sure, but you have to meet all the security requirements. So. Um, that's it's uh, it's a way of having people feel free. <laughs> But I, yeah. I, agree. I think having a central platform that has the guardrails baked in um, is is key, as long as it's as long as the people running the platform also aren't running how the pipelines are built. You know, the guardrails are there, but it's it, it shouldn't be the teams waiting on the central platform to build pipelines for them. Yeah, because then you get into that whole uh, waiting on people and tickets uh, to yeah. 
to get that work done, which is painful. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, I'm as a central team, I'm constantly fighting for headcount when people think, oh, it's 30 applications. Why do you need 30 engineers? And But my work should be done in five minutes from the time I put a request in because it's it's not difficult. And yeah, you can't have uh, work all the time uh, because yeah, it's, it's easy. This is just pipelines. So I just want to drive home one key point that Sumit made, which I want to make sure it doesn't get lost. I like the central approach with an enablement team. <laughs> and that, because I've seen the central approach without the enablement team. And a lot of times these poor people are just, they're asked to do something that they don't have the support or knowledge how to do. That's it. And, and you're not wrong in that statement um, as being an individual who has that central platform, getting teams on to the platform and then realizing they do not have the skill or ability to, to actually perform. And, and you try to make it as easy as possible, but the only thing they come to you with is, I have a deadline and I have to hit this deadline at any cost and we'll cut any corner at any cost to make sure I hit that deadline. Um, further exacerbates, it starts getting into an organizational problem and something we've been dealing, or my organization's been dealing with is we're trying to move individuals or teams to the, the, the platform, but we recognize they've been doing things so wrong that if they start to move, they will be exposed for all of their bad behavior. And if they're exposed for all of their bad behavior, you know, heads will roll and they're terrified. So trying to address the culture problem and the, and the technology issue at the same time is a beast. And, and this is killing us right now. Um, and as particularly when this was heavily built by contractors and, and again, we'll, we'll deliver at any cost. And, and when you try to make it as easy and as simple, as painless as possible, what you find out they're not gonna follow the good practices or the safe practices because they will be exposed for years of bad behavior and they're protected by that. <laughs> then I'm at a loss. I, I, I can't get you know teams to come to us and I can't go fix their problems. Yeah. So I just want to make one more quick point and then let our speakers get back is the other purpose of the enablement team is not just to support them, but it's to get feedback on how good your central platform is, <laughs> you know, when they actually have to implement it for other teams. Mm -hmm. I'm done. Great point. But let's let our speakers get Thanks, back, Steve. I think. No, this, we love the, the dialogue. This is terrific. We're learning tons. Um, awesome. So the, the, the fifth learning from the survey is uh, relying upon tribal knowledge isn't a great go forward strategy in terms of secrets and configuration management control. What we found is um, in, in many organizations, uh, typically a small group of quote unquote elders knows why the system is configured the way it is. And it makes it tough for others to be able to correlate changes to outcomes and understand in the past when certain changes were set made to like memory settings, timeouts, cache sizes, um, how that impacted performance, uptime, security, SLAs, and most services these days, you know, have hundreds of different levers um, that all need understanding about what you're doing um, if you're gonna try to move beyond defaults. And that ties into another theme that we heard is uh, moving beyond the defaults with confidence is really challenging because of the lack of that memorialized institutional knowledge. So what we think is um, configuration needs some type of lightweight context aware collaboration around it in a way that makes sense to all the other collaboration that's going on in the DevOps organization. Um, but you just can't rely upon a comment buried in a GitHub PR or buried in a wiki as a way to surface an important uh, concern around a configuration setting for a discrete uh, service or uh, PaaS um, API layer that you're working with um, as a way for everyone to really understand uh, why it's set the way it is, what happened in the past when it was a different setting, and what might be expect um, a potential problem by changing it. Um, and if you're trying to get a, a more positive outcome, you might be let down and uh, make things actually worse. So we think there's some areas of opportunity for vendors to help customers manage configuration data from a different perspective and to go attack this problem of tribal knowledge isn't um, the best way to keep track of how things are set up. 
does this seem like a, a theme that you see in your organizations? I'm just curious. A um, couple thumbs up there, heads nods. Yeah, okay. Um, this was surprising. I didn't expect that we would hear this to the extent that we did. And so it was sort of a, a for us, a divining rod to go and, and sort of, you know, uh, pull up some rocks and see if there's some other findings that we can correlate into a, a kind of a product narrative for down the road. It's, it's a knowledge management problem. Uh, the, I, the talk I liked best on this, and I think it might've been from one of the previous doors was on uh, the uh, low context versus high context culture and uh, environments. So this, this idea of just the right information at the right time and the way that you set that up by putting in um, templates for the gathering of knowledge, uh, linking things together, ensuring knowledge is stored directly where it's needed versus being off in some other repository where it's never maintained and uh, these kind of things. So there's lots of really good stuff around that. That's terrific. Oh, thanks for sharing that. Because that's the way we think about this is um, where say a dev or a DevOps professional might be dealing with a specific setting for a discrete service, having that in context history of its values, what the outcome of those values were, whether it was a positive outcome or negative outcome um, without having to go on to a, a Sherlock Holmes sleuthing episode to figure it out um, is something that could be helpful um, for in the moment decision-making. The sixth learning is around this concept of uh, when we interviewed uh, our respondents, over two thirds indicated that they're suffering from too many layers of past decision making in terms of the tools that were chosen, the different practices that were in place around how to configure and manage secrets. It's dragging them down in terms of productivity and getting more things going um, in a faster forward momentum. Um, it typically correlates with projects that have been in the cloud for about five years or more. So projects that are early into the cloud don't suffer from this too much. Um, so if you start to get in sort of half a decade where you had prior regimes of decision-making, um, if you're a cloud native company, you might've started off with the CTO or the VP of engineering making these decisions. As you got larger, you brought in your dedicated DevOps team. They made different choices. As the organization grows, you have multiple DevOps teams running in parallel, making decentralized decisions around this. And it adds up to uh, quite a, a mess around not understanding you know, how everything interrelates with each other. Um, it impacts policies and workflows. That theme of tribal knowledge is also at play here. It's um, an area that the vendors in this space can do better at in terms of making more e things easier in interoperability, uh, more straightforward. And also the ability for customers to remove a tool with confidence understanding what that tool did in the past, why it may or may not be relevant going forward, and ultimately trying to simplify our uh, tool stack that runs behind the scenes. So there's uh, uh, too many layers that customers in the cloud that have been dealing with this for five or more years are, are dealing with that's stopping them uh, forward momentum on their, on their goals. And the seventh learning um, is a theme that we heard over and over around the tension that's building between dev and ops. And I'd like Matt to expand upon this topic because it's an area where he's um, been spending some um, thought leadership cycles um, noodling on this. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, the, the root of this is that, um, you know, developers just have different concerns than operations, right? Developers are focused on uh, iteration speed and, you know, building the product and, and sort of maybe innovating and, you know, um, you know, just trying to get stuff out the door, uh, while ops is more focused on, you know, well, how do we protect our, our systems? Um, how do we monitor our systems? Um, and, and they're typically, you know, as I said before, cutting across a bunch of different products. And, you know, it's, it's very hard sometimes to get a developer to pay attention to ops issues because it's not their strength, right? You know, they're focused on uh, you know, writing code and understanding the, 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 the software systems that they're working with. And they don't want to take the time necessarily to go figure out how to use Terraform, right? You know, or don't necessarily want to figure out uh, well, how do I ensure that uh, I'm not exposing any security holes to the, the system by doing something a certain way. Um, and likewise for, you know, the, the ops side, right? They're you know, they don't necessarily have the time or, um, you know, desire to be able to learn 
about the difficulties that you know the the developers have in in building their products. So there's this there's natural tension, right? They're they're focused on different problems that they're trying to solve, and sometimes those problems butt up against each other. Um, and you know, you know, part of configuration management is I think is you know helping them communicate around those problems more effectively, so that um, you know the, the 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 concerns that normally would be a source of tension um, kind of go away, or at least get addressed in a in a rigorous manner. Yeah, thanks, uh, Matt. Uh, one area that I've seen this uh, manifest is um, around secrets management choices, and I've had many conversations with both DevOps leader and cloud SecOps leaders. Um, devs by far prefer uh, something like HashiCorp Vault as a way to manage secrets. It's more dev friendly. It has a robust uh, ecosystem of APIs and, and language bindings and modules uh, versus CyberArk um, is a preferred among the security professionals uh, in terms of what they want to see. And so there's that tension rising again um, between dev and ops around even security systems and tools where one platform is preferred by one group um, versus another. And we see that um, over and over in larger organizations where um, you have potentially even multiple tools at play um, involved with this. I'm just curious, um, does this um, sound familiar to uh, conversations you hear in your organizations, the tension between dev and ops? Um, is this something that we clued into or do you agree okay. or disagree? For, this is no idea Townsend. what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Security always wins, whatever they want, right? That's true. So, and for us anyway, that's that's just the rules. Security gets what they want. But uh, when it comes to the infrastructure as code, we the dev developers told us they didn't want to learn that, and we told them, well, too bad, right? But then we we figured we can come up with uh, modules for Terraform, right, and templates for them, and they seemed happy about that. Yeah, that's that's a pretty common um, a common strategy for going forward. Uh, awesome. Well, we're ready to wrap up. Just wanted to close with some a summization of what we talked about. And, um, you know, this is, this is a really important topic for us to, as professionals in the cloud dev systems management space, um, to get our hands around what we're seeing with the fast evolution of the cloud, um, the fact that the tooling may not catch up um, to where the cloud's at, and that opens up areas of risk around security issues and um, unplanned downtime. And we think that um, this is gonna be an area of you know, innovation going towards the future. And Matt, would you have to, uh, any closing comments you'd like to uh, impart to the group before we wrap up? But you're on mute, I think. I was on mute and then my screen changed. So I didn't know what the hell was going on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I think, you know, it's, um, it's a big problem, right? Um, you know, there's, there's lots of aspects to it. Uh, I'm, I, I doubt we'll solve all of them, but, you know, we're going to try and address, uh, in order the ones we, we feel are important. And, um, you know, some of that revolves around, you know, communication and, and understanding. And some of that revolves around, you know, enforcing best practices when you're making, uh, you know, protecting your secrets or your configuration uh, across your system. So it's an interesting world. Maybe live in interesting times, someone once said. Uh, great. We'd love to you know, have some Q&A or further discussion around any topic that seems interesting. We appreciate your audience tonight and uh, your chance to tell you our thoughts around how um, configuration and secrets management plays into uh, good cloud operations best practices. So, okay, I've got a, I've got kind of a question there, and it kind of goes, it, it, it kind of threads the line between like the dev and the ops and the integrating with other teams thing. So, part part of how I've tried to handle a similar situation on my side is like we, well, well, certain people have specialties we make the entire application experience responsible, like everyone's responsible for that. So like, just because you don't wanna learn ops, well, you need to know how your 
how your application runs on a server because otherwise you're not helping anybody because your application isn't running. So, so if from that sense, we, we, we try to do a pretty good job of tying that all together. But in terms of like these external dependencies, like with security and whatnot, um, one of the things that we really try to focus on is, is less on tooling and more on interfaces, which I think is something someone mentioned earlier in terms of like, like what, what do you need out of this? Not like what tool should I use? And now in my, in my situation, I tend to get away with that because we have a really old, really legacy thing and most modern tooling doesn't even work on our old AI Xboxes to begin with. So like, I, I have like, like the reverse Dino card of legacy actually working for me for once in this situation. But like as a general rule, like how does, how, how does anyone else deal with, with that kind of tension? Because we, we make everything everyone's problem because it's important and we think that's the right thing to do. But I, I'm like, like, how, like making that work outside of my little corner of the world, I guess is, I guess is where I'm trying to figure out how to extend that out into the, into the wider work. So, so what we've been doing, because we're trying to build a, like a dev AI ops, right? For the AI ML platforms. And we started out by just doing empathy mapping and empathy interviews and finding out what people's problems were and what their concerns were. And it built really good relationships with a lot of the other teams, which you need um, that allowed us to have conversations and got them to actually listen to us. Um, now we did have a bit of a, uh, not quite an existential crisis, but, a, you know, a heavy leadership push that we took advantage of because there was an audit that, that needed to be dealt with. So there was, you know, we, we piggybacked on, you know, the pressure because of this existential audit, but I think it starts with talking to people and conversations and finding out what their problems are and then how you, how your tooling can help solve them. I don't know if that helps, but th that that's what's so far started working for us. But yeah. talk to me a year from now. Yeah, no kidding. And I was, I was noodling over like, you know, a good part of the opening part of the conversation talking about, you know, different teams and different tools and how do we centralize these things. And I'm not actually convinced that having different tools is actually a problem. Um, it's only it's only really a problem for the people who want to have their hands in everything, and that comes back to that interfacing question. So, my mind is bouncing around a few aspects of this thing, as as I listen. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we've had this conversation around monitoring tools, uh, uh, for instance. Uh, should we all be using the same monitoring tools? And uh, I think it was mentioned around uh, how moving from one project to the other. Now, if, if everybody is moving from project to product, then that shouldn't be a problem. But also uh, as a big organization, and if it's not a SaaS system, or even if it's a SaaS system, you, you get into uh, topics of who owns, uh, who owns that relationship and then uh, has it been secured correctly? And uh, back to back to what we were talking about earlier, uh, that what is the minimum security requirement and what's the minimum interface to something that is central? Uh, for example, if it's, uh, if it's your uh, incident response or something, then you need to you need to say it minimally needs to conform to X. From a security perspective, and integrations, uh, why? And yeah, what what I've found time and time again is uh, teams would go uh, want another tool, but as soon as you told them, okay, you can run it on your own, it pretty much devolved into not getting a second tool because they don't want to own the whole thing. They, I'm the fool that says yes to that answer. So that threat doesn't work with me. That just makes me the guy that makes all the edge cases. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing is, if if you are in that organizational setup where, yeah, we'll, we'll bring in another tool because a business says so, and then the central tools organization just gets to own another tool, then back to... Uh, 
back to the original thing where you've got 15 tools doing the same thing, managed by the same ops team, they're pulling their hair out because yeah, now you've got, and then you're not getting gains from your vendor relationships because you've got 15 products using 15 different ones and uh, yeah, commercially you could be a lot better off by we took a compliance we took a compliance approach and and just said we're going to have sort of one tool to rule them all you can log and dashboard and monitor any way you want as long as you can also output to this system and we can read what you output and create dashboards from it so our ops team is now using a single tool but the individual teams are using their own tools yeah and that's what i was saying that yeah as long as you conform to the integration that is required centrally but again, right. uh, the, the thing is, uh, if you've got now 15 teams running 15 tools, uh, is that, I mean, it, it might be necessary, but yeah, that's the, that's the whole point. You, you own it and run it front to back and conform to that minimal requirement that the organization places. Yeah, and we did it specifically because some of the systems that we have being monitored are not ours, they're suppliers. And we couldn't really tell them, well, you have to use this, right? We just said, we have to be able to read what you log. Yeah. And so SaaS systems is, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, and they're usually built in that way that they can just stream to uh, stream to a sim or, uh, yeah, provide metrics to another system. It, yeah, uh, the other the other topic that I wanted to touch upon was that whole dev versus ops one and uh, something you mentioned, James, about uh, dev uh, one dev not wanting to write infrastructure as code and uh, something I've found in as as part of being part of the cloud and DevOps central organization. Uh, in the company is that you can force them to write infrastructure as code, uh, but then they still lack uh, the uh, the ops knowledge and they keep coming back to you for every single thing with that templatization and creation of modules. And what you truly want to do, which is what I think DevOps intended to start off is that collaboration between the ops teams and uh, the dev teams and really create that uh, overall app team, uh, the cross-functional team and get, get people to collaborate. So it should have also happened the other way where the ops teams learned how to do Git and write code and not just sysadmin on a Linux shell. Uh, I know there's there's quite a few who are doing it, but uh, yeah, the... we we had we had these very specific teams that was like they were just doing mainly lambda functions, but they they would have one admin per like five teams, right? That was their ops person, so we couldn't have them on the you know we were doing dojos, right? So we couldn't have them in that session with us all the time. Uh, and that's part of the reason we wound up even getting into the infrastructure as code because we're like, well, we can't wait for this person to deploy something for you, you know, and they're in India and you're here. They're not going to get your message until tomorrow morning. So it, we, we wound up just teaching the developers uh, for this simple application, at least it worked out very well to just use infrastructure as code, right? Uh, and and it, it worked fine. They did take that back to their teams and they're, they're working now to get to embed ops on the teams, which is Right, but but at the time it just wasn't feasible. Yeah, and uh, it's it's truly uh, the I think shifting the mindset of the organization from yeah, uh, it's it's devs just do functional development and everything else is somebody else's problem to uh, to getting that whole holistic view or, and cross functional view in the cloud because yeah, what is infrastructure in the cloud? If everything is defined as code and everything is an API call, uh, there's really no infrastructure anymore. And it's just layers of services. 
a similar well, issue. The new infrastructure, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, Brianna. No, go, go ahead. ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to add. <laughs> go ahead, Brianna, please. I was going to say again, another cultural issue is uh, we've we've had dev, you know, developers and ops individuals who want to work together, but we're dealing with they're not allowed to work together because they report up to different reporting structures. And so trying to resolve this, we they desperately want to fix this. They are the right people to fix this. They know how to do this or they have the ambition to learn. It doesn't matter where they are in their, their work experience, you know, levels. But we report to different VPs and we are never allowed to resolve that issue. So then it dies on the vine. And and you know, any any Steve's agreeing with me here, you know, it's just like you desperately want to fix this. You have all the right people. It's not a training issue. It's just we're not allowed to work together. And, and it's an organizational problem. Yeah, it's a culture <laughs> issue. Yeah, that's where I was going. Yeah. And and I think the butt of what uh, my colleague and I are on this call, face are actually more organizational issues. Like we could solve the technology issues. It's it's but we're when you gotta fight your own organization day in and day out for simple, simple, you know, like can we can we borrow this individual for, you know, a day, just a day, give me a day, eight hours. Who's gonna pay for it? And I'm like, you gotta be kidding so, me. So <laughs> so, so can, if you were able to borrow somebody even on the side and create some small wins, would that help drive change? Under Take care, Brian. management, yes, not currently. Um, so uh, just to- Can't that change point. management, change jobs. Yeah, yeah. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Just to, just to this point of, can I borrow this person for a day? Um, I'm, again, a central cloud team, uh, DevOps team, where total between the two teams around 20 to 25 people. We currently have 100 products trying to move to the cloud. And just as a ask, if I start giving out one person, for the number of teams asking me, I'd have zero people doing the central work. So that's the challenge uh, that, uh, yeah. Totally get it, I'm in the same situation. I've only got seven people on an operational team <laughs> trying to move 150 applications. So I, I feel your pain, really, really. Yeah, so uh, the thing is, uh, a lot of the times you want to help. The problem is that one, uh, the app teams aren't hiring uh, for to kind of fill that gap and you're not in a, in a central function, you're not getting the budgets and the people to uh, be able to help, like provide those helping hands. Uh, yeah. And uh, Peter, uh, Peter summarized it as fun. <laughs> no, no, I get that. But at the same time, these are individuals who are willing to give their own time off peak hours to handle these situations. This is still need the blessing to be able to go talk and get access to some of the systems, right? Because all of a sudden you're starting to run into security patients. Why are application teams all of a sudden needing, you know, um, access to, to the platform? And, and that creates very, um, it creates sens sensitivity. So even though it's just an experiment, we're running an experiment or we're just trying something out and we're going to do it and it's not going to impact anyone, you know, during regular business hours, this is just an experimentation. It's just the amount of friction that we get for it. No, this isn't going to happen. And for no apparent reason, the answer is no. So, totally understand these situations. It sounds like we, we practically work at the same organization. People are everywhere. So, so Greg and Matthew, this was a great presentation. You identified, you did good at identifying the problems. Uh, uh, I'm curious to see how you solve them. Um, so uh, it, it sounds like you're looking for beta users, et cetera. Um, what can we do to support you and uh, what are your sort of next steps? Yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for asking that. So where we are is we're, we're fast approaching a uh, launch of a general availability offering. And right now we're in early access mode and our initial uh, offering to the market is around this new type of parameter store to help centrally manage parameters, environment variables, as well as secrets, working alongside of your existing tools and agnostic to the underlying cloud layer. So something that works across Azure, uh, GCP, AWS. Uh, our focus is on the configuration management data layer that's now existing in every project using the cloud. I'm happy to uh, set up a time to give a, a demo, if that would be interesting. Um, 
we sort of didn't want to be any vendor specific on this discussion, but uh, we're curious whether or not what we're working on resonates with this audience and definitely looking for feedback on the concepts. Um, our strategy is overall is to provide a configuration intelligence service that can help you manage um, a lot of these concerns that we're raising and finding out during our product market fit surveys in a way that's appropriate for how existing teams are using their current tools and their attitudes around you know, good configuration hygiene going forward. So you're kind of combining console and vault into a single tool to provide a hash table that's globally distributed so you can easily access and distribute the configurations out onto servers? Yeah, think of what we're trying to do as a, a globally available, abstracted, single record of provisioning and configuration uh, truth for infrastructure, apps and services and secrets. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think the analogy of mashing up vault and console offered as a service, hiding all the complexity, uh, you get all the high availability, the uptime, the SLAs that you would want um, for a service of this nature um, is somewhat appropriate. We also have the ability to manage uh, multiple environments from a single interface and a templating capability that's built into the parameter store. So you can use this service to actually drive your configuration and link it into CICD or to be an API endpoint for an app or service to fetch its config values. So you can start to simplify um, some of the components that you have in a dev op stack now um, collapsing onto one platform versus having to run multiple things in parallel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, check out cloudtruth.com and uh, reach out if you'd like uh, some more, more information. Sure, I'm always uh, happy to chat and find out about new things. Sounds interesting. Cool. Awesome. Uh, so, so thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you. I, I have to run too. So, uh, and uh, I will uh, have a great evening. You all later. Thank you for okay. joining. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.